well, I think we still have a few people uh, joining us from the waiting room, but uh, time is short and we have lots of big ideas. So I think we should probably get started. Uh, my name is Danny Schneider. I'm a professor of public policy and sociology here at Harvard University. Um, and I've been really fortunate to be able to bring together a great group of people with uh, uh, just expert assistance of Pam Metz in the social policy program. Many thanks to, to Pam for her work on this whole series and especially um, from my perspective on, on the work today. Um, I'm delighted to welcome all of you to the third session of this fall's Five Big Ideas on Inequality series. This week, we take up the question of inequality and COVID-19. Um, and we're really lucky to be joined by a group of outstanding social scientists and the timing as we envision a new administration committed to tackling the COVID-19 crisis could not be better for hearing about these scholars' big ideas on inequality and COVID-19. Uh, so time is short. Uh, and we have asked each speaker to simply begin with a short self-introduction. We'll first hear from Elizabeth Wrigley Field, then turn to Luke Schaefer, Katie Collins, and Bradley Hardy, and, and I'll go last. The speakers will each keep to eight or nine minutes, ensuring that we have time for discussion from this great group of participants. Please use the raised hand feature if you'd like to ask your question out loud, or please feel free to use the chat box, either to me directly or to the whole group instead, um, and I'll call the questions after we've gotten through our five uh, panelists for today. Okay, um, I think we might as well get started. And uh, Elizabeth, would you please uh, take it away? Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Wrigley Field. That is my real name, Mom's Wrigley, Dad's Field. I'm an assistant professor of sociology at the University of Minnesota. Uh, where I'm a formal demographer, which means I specialize in math models that shift perspectives between individual and population perspectives. I am doing some work on COVID-19 um, in the context of Minnesota, but what I'm going to show you do today is use COVID to teach us something uh, about what's happening all the time in the United States, not just during pandemics. So I want to start with the 1918 flu. Um, that pandemic was shocking in its virulence. So this graph shows infectious mortality for urban whites um, through the 1940s. And 1918 was almost off the charts. Um, and now I wanna show you something that changed my perspective on this flu forever when my collaborators, James, uh, James Feigenbaum, Chris Moeller found it about two years ago. That huge spike in mortality for whites is still less than the infectious mortality that urban blacks experienced in that era every single year. When we first found this result, we assumed that we had made a mistake. So we looked at the data all different ways to check it and try to find the error. Um, but it turns out that it's true. And it's true not just about infectious disease mortality, it's true in total mortality also. So white mortality during the 1918 flu was less than typical non-pandemic black mortality was almost every year through the 1930s. Uh, and similarly, the white population's life expectancy during the 1918 pandemic fell dramatically, but it was still less than the black population's life expectancy had ever been. Knowing this, this past May, I started wondering whether the same thing would be true in this pandemic. Racial inequality is still extreme. So the best ever black mortality and life expectancy in US history, that's what's shown in these light blue dashed lines here. Um, they're similar to levels that whites experienced 20 or 30 years earlier. So for understanding the scale of these disparities, you can think it's like as if the black population had simply been denied two or three decades of mortality progress is one way you can conceptualize that. So I asked, how does that gap compare with the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, and specifically, how many excess deaths among whites in this pandemic would it take to raise white mortality to the best ever black levels? To answer this, I had to make some assumptions about what ages those excess deaths in the pandemic are happening in. And since we don't really know that yet, I made a range of assumptions about that that are different uh, that are kind of plausible and got a range of estimated deaths that looks like this. I found that for white, uh, to raise white 2020 mortality to the lowest ever black levels would take about 400,000 extra white deaths this year 
and perhaps 1 million excess white deaths um, for 2020 life expectancy to fall to the best recorded black level. Black level. And just for a sense of scale, the CDC numbers today have about 78,000 uh, deaths among whites to COVID so far. So what this is telling us is that even if the black population hypothetically had been immune to the coronavirus, white mortality in 2020 would still be less than black mortality has ever been. So we know in reality that the black population along with indigenous and immigrant populations have had the heaviest COVID toll. So what is this hypothetical comparison telling us? I think pandemics are special because they're intimately linked to social action. We haven't done a fraction of what I think we should to stop this pandemic um, and to make stopping it survivable for much of the population. But at the same time, from the perspective of just nine months ago, what we have done actually is staggering. Um, and what stands out to me most is the speed with which we changed our assumptions about what's reasonable um, to stop the spread of COVID. So for me, it was about 10 days in March that radically reoriented all of my assumptions and plans about the next, let's say, two years of my life. I think that was true for a lot of us, which poses the question, what if we were as serious about stopping deaths associated with racism as we are about stopping deaths associated with pandemics? In the last six years, one radical response to racism has entered the mainstream of discussion. I'm talking about reparations. These proposals focus on a common lever for redressing American inequality, which is wealth. And that makes sense. There is no single greater for proxy for power than wealth. African Americans were enslaved to create it. Indigenous peoples were dispossessed to take control of it and nothing else confers as much power. So wealth has to be a centerpiece of any plan of redress for racism. And yet, Grappling with the magnitude of inequality in American mortality has made me wonder about other levers that might be needed as well. If wealth is the best single proxy for power, then I would argue that time, how much we get, how much we get to control it, might be the best single proxy for freedom. And as much as the, as the normal operation of our society is built on stealing wealth, so it is also built on stealing time a theft just as central to slavery or the theft of labor power. Today, that theft looks different. Uh, if the loss of the time, it, the, the loss of time to excess death is the loss of connections to other people. Um, it, is, uh, it is the cruelty of administrative burdens imposed on the poor to access social services. It's the loss of time to work without autonomy scheduled unpredictably, located far from neighborhoods where black workers live. It's the staggering losses of incarceration. And what it means above all, I think, is the loss of our effects on the world, the loss of our personal projects, the chance to see our loved ones and ourselves at different stages to let our ideas unfurl in time to develop the synthesis of wisdom. It's the loss of our chance to exercise ourselves uh, as full human beings. Would these losses be repaired by wealth-based reparations? Perhaps. Uh, I suspect that wealth-based reparations would do more to resolve these disparities than any other single policy would. But they might not solve the ways that the medical system treats black patients with skepticism and hostility. The way that doctors, for example, devalue black pain and they might not solve the deadly consequences of environmental racism. So for example, the way that wealth lets you buy your way out of air pollution is by giving you the option to move. Um, but while the, the right to move freely has been a fundamental part pillar of the civil rights struggles in the United States, we might also wish to embrace a right to stay put, to stay where your history and your family are and have it be a safe place to live. So we could imagine health reparations that encompass programs like a mass expansion of medical care through the mass training of medical workers of color or mass environmental cleanups. We could envision reparations at the community level aimed at doing whatever it takes to stop stealing black lives. But more than any other single policy, what I hope we will embrace is a radical scale of action.
racism produces a pandemic's worth of needless death every single year. That was true a century ago, it's still true today. And so our tools for fighting it should be pandemic scale tools also. Our imagination and social ambition should not be limited by how accustomed the United States is to profound racial inequality. Instead of looking at social policies and asking or what's realistic, the simple question we should ask is just what will work? Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, fantastic. Let's, uh, and thank you for giving some time and, and conveying so much. Uh, I'm gonna pass it over now to Luke Schaefer. Um, Luke, please take it away. Hi everyone, it's really great to be with you. Um, I'm really excited to hear everyone's ideas. Um, I run an initiative at the University of Michigan called Poverty Solutions. We seek to partner with communities and policymakers to find new ways to prevent and alleviate poverty to really get beyond sort of basic research and into exactly what we can do about it, exactly the types of questions we're talking about today. I started my career as a quantitative researcher working with large scale data sets. And, and then at some point I started hanging out with Kathy Eden, uh, first in a project where we um, went around the country hanging out with really, really, really poor families, particularly families who um, lack cash income. So they might have cash uh, food assistance, sometimes housing, although that's relatively rare, but no money. And our current project is really working on um, getting to know really, really disadvantaged communities, looking at a range of characteristics, including income, but also health and social mobility to try to understand that story. So I've firmly become a, a mixed method researcher. I find um, that uh, nothing makes me happier than a good chart um, or, uh, you know, uh, stata output. I would cuddle it up at night if I could, except my wife says no stata output in the bed. But I also recognize that sometimes uh, from my positionality, I don't even know the right questions to ask, that getting out and talking with people and letting their agenda drive my agenda takes me much further. So let me ask you to go on a thought experiment. Let me ask you to go on a dream. What if I told you that I had a policy that would lead to a massive reduction in child poverty, would reduce racial inequalities, and had been tried and tested uh, in many different countries around the world? Too good to be true? Does it sound uh, like a pipe dream? Well, let me introduce you to a child allowance. And as uh, policy wonks in the United States, because we like to make things as hard to understand as possible, uh, what some will refer to as a refundable, a fully refundable child tax credit. I'm gonna talk about it as a child allowance. So a child allowance rests on a set of principles. It starts with principles. The first principle is in any time, raising kids is expensive and society has reason to ensure that it's done well. Yet in the United States, uh, Households with children and children, they experience the highest rates of poverty, the highest rates of hardship. They're the most likely of any age group to live in a home that's food insecure, that live in a home that has trouble paying their rent or utilities. And COVID has really been a perfect storm for families with kids, right? Not only has there been massive job loss, but childcare centers have shut down uh, and schools have shut down and, and we're in constant flux, right? Um, it's incredibly hard. So we have a moral and a, and a logical obligation to help families with kids. And the idea of a child allowance is that we're gonna do that with money. So $250, $300 per child per month to, to help families do right by their kids. So it's simple, right? I think in the policy wonk world, we often like to get complicated, but every time you introduce a trapezoid structure, uh, a notch in the schedule, parallelograms, trapezoids, whatever sort of, shape that you're going to do, you lose some people. It becomes a little bit harder to understand, right? The second piece is that cash is king, right? It rests on the idea that families know what they need the most, that they know how to do right by their children, and that needs vary, right? Some people might not need help with food, but they might need help with housing. Some people might need help with uh, getting a laptop for their child, but maybe they have housing, right? So we're going to say that we're going to empower families. We're going to say they know what's best. They know the best way. Um, to do it. It rests on principles of both equality and equity. So Theta Scotchpole, I'm a firm believer in the idea that universality, when we can fold the most people into one policy structure instead of dividing them, right? And we're gonna do some things for poor families and some things for middle-class families. The more we treat everyone the same, the more robust support for a program, the more 
um, long, more longevity a program will have. But equity is a concern too. And it turns out our group of refundable tax credits, they don't do right by ch children of color. Take the refundable child tax credit. It phases up as earnings go up. And it means 35% of all children don't get the full credit. They don't get the full credit. And that's unacceptable to me, especially as someone who cares about the poorest of the poor. But 53% of children who are black don't get the whole credit. So this is not an equitable policy. And by, by using an idea, right, of using an idea of equality, right, making sure everybody gets treated the same, we make sure that some children aren't treated differently. All right, so what would be the effects? Well, middle-class families, they would get a, a hand up, right? They would, we would understand the middle-class families, they have trouble with childcare, they, they maybe have trouble saving for college, whatever they think the, the issue might be. We would also cut child poverty by 42%, 42%, just with a $250 a month child allowance to families that cuts out around 100,000 uh, annual income. We would cut child poverty among black children by 50%. We would have it, right? We would cut deep poverty by 50%. It would be an excellent uh, response to COVID, right? When you imagine that of all the great things we did in the CARES Act, and by the way, I'm a big fan of the CARES Act, we did nothing in particular that was substantial to really help families with kids. And they're the ones who are struggling the most. And we would eliminate the kind of poverty that Kathy and I talk about our book, that motivated our book, $2 a day we can make my book a historical artifact. It also, looking at the evidence, because we've seen it, right? We don't have to guess about what it's gonna be like. We can look at other can countries like Canada, where they introduced it and then expanded it. They were so happy with it. We can see there's not really much in the way of adverse labor force participation impacts, right? It's because we get rid of one of the big reasons why we see that in a lot of our programs, the marginal tax rates. We're just gonna say, everybody gets the same amount and you can work or you don't work wherever you are, you lose a job, you don't lose your benefits. Okay, so um, I went up for full professor a few years ago and I will always remember, right? You always remember the negative comments the most. So I always remember one of the papers in that packet was a co-authored piece with, I think there were 10 authors um, about a child allowance saying, hey, uh, let's, let's do this. And this is what it would look like. And this is the anti-poverty effects. And I remember one of the reviewers came back and said, well, it's, I guess it's okay for Professor Schaefer and his colleagues to talk about things that will never become law in the United States, right? Somebody has to dream big um, to maybe push things a little bit. Well, since then, uh, William Julius Wilson's come out in support. He has a really nice quote. Some of you uh, may know him, Angus Deaton, uh, but then J.D. Vance and a report from the National Academy of Sciences, right? This idea has been codified in a bill called the American Family Act in the Senate uh, and in the House of Representatives that has huge support across um, uh, both memberships, in both houses. And it was recently, two years of funding on pretty much precisely this idea was recently uh, adopted in the Biden tax plan. So. Um, Mitt Romney, right, uh, yesterday when asked what were some of the things that he could imagine doing that would be uh, something where they could find um, collaboration and partnership with the Biden administration, highlighted a, an expanded child tax credit as sort of the number one thing, right? So this is now something that could become reality and maybe not that long from now. So my scholarly um, and professional response to that reviewer is suck it. So if this happens, right, and this could happen, this could happen this year, this could happen next year, it's gonna be like a quiet revolution, right? We're gonna see huge declines in poverty and I'm not pretending that it's a silver bullet, all of the huge issues, right? Nobody can look at the slides that Professor Wrigley Field uh, just put up and say that like all of that's not gonna go away, right? But we can narrow that, right? We can do something in a way that's gonna both be supported by middle-class families and the families that I care about most. Um, and I think it will be a great example, um, example of science and scholarship sort of moving a body of work on a policy that has the potential to transform my lives. And I look forward, hopefully next year, to coming back, uh, maybe not as a speaker, but sending you a note to say, um, this was the impact and we'll see exactly how it worked out. And I'll have to go write some other book about something that's still relevant. Great, well, thanks a lot. Thanks, Luke. Um, we're going to uh, move along now to our, our third uh, speaker and, and her big ideas. Um, 
Uh, Katie Collins, please take it away. Great, thank you. Danny, thank you very much for the kind invitation to join you today. I am an assistant professor of sociology at Washington University in St. Louis, and I study gender inequality in the workplace and in family life. And today I'm pleased to share some insights from my recent book, Making Motherhood Work, as well as some recent collaborative research on maternal employment and inequality during the pandemic. And conveniently, some of these remarks uh, today are gonna appear in Harvard Business Review's new big idea package on the childcare crisis that drops this Thursday. So um, I'm excited to share a bit more detail there. Let's dive in. So amid the grim landscape of the pandemic and the US election, I see one bright light. And that bright light in my mind is the fact that parents are realizing that the government can and should do far more to support them at work and at home. I study the experiences of working parents in different countries. And so, so lately I'm often asked this question, is it this bad everywhere? And my answer is no, <laughs> absolutely not. Other Western industrialized countries have long understood that I, the idea that supportive social policy improves the well-being of their citizens. After all, citizens are former, current, and future workers and taxpayers. And we know that every nation depends on people's paid labor in the workforce and also their unpaid labor at home to produce the next generation. Their solutions differ, but other societies agree that the public sector has a responsibility to help reconcile work and family demands. And in the US, by contrast, our emphasis on free markets and our fixation on personal responsibility mean that we lack any coherent work family policy to support caregiving. We have no universal health care, no universal child care, no universal social insurance entitlement, no guaranteed basic income, no paid parental leave or illness leave, no federal mandate to, um, to compel employers to offer supportive policies to working parents not even a single vacation or sick day. Before the pandemic and every conversation I had with working mothers, the thread was the exact same. Parents are, are on their own when it comes to resolving their struggles, no matter how piecemeal the solutions. American mothers I discovered generally blame themselves for their stress and their difficulties and their problems with uh, what they call imbalance. And they take personal responsibility for the challenges that European mothers recognize as having external causes. But framing work-family conflict as a problem of imbalance normalizes a nation of mothers engulfed in stress. And it fails to recognize how our institutions fan this anxiety. Mother self-blame, I think, is logical in a country that says families are a private responsibility. But the truth is that the United States free market approach has failed families spectacularly. Americans are among the most stressed out people on the planet. The happiness gap between parents and non-parents is among the widest in any OECD country. We have one of the biggest gender wage gaps between employed women and men, and it's even wider when we look specifically at women of color. And our children are suffering. One in five American children live in poverty. A staggering one in three black children and one in four Hispanic children compared with one in, one, one in 10 white children. And one in seven households today uh, with children report food insecurity. And to my way of thinking, the pandemic has made a bad situation much worse. The meager patchwork supports that uh, and forms of pandemic relief that seem to, in my mind, sort of mirror the meager patchwork family supports we had before the pandemic, right? And families are feeling the stress. When schools and daycares closed, essential workers who are disproportionately women of color in the US were forced to find other options for their children or quit their jobs. And those able to work from home found themselves juggling their work and family needs, including overseeing virtual education. And because they're still mostly responsible for caregiving and housework, it is employed mothers who have been hit hardest. In April and May, moms working from home reported feeling anxious and depressed and lonely at far higher rates than fathers in the same position. Colleagues and I have found that US moms uh, with young kids have reduced their working hours four to five times more than dads during the pandemic and four times as many women are leaving the workforce as men right now. We also know that economic and racial disparities are widening. The wealth of America's billionaires has soared during COVID-19 while food insecurity has tripled among families with children. Black and Hispanic families are twice as likely to struggle to afford food as similar white families today. And again, to my way of thinking, this deliberate privation is untenable and it's time for us to do something about it. This impossible scenario in which families, especially mothers, find themselves is not of their own making. 
and parents are realizing, especially in the pandemic, that it cannot be resolved by individual efforts to work harder, to find balance. Mother's difficulties, I argue, working and raising kids are part of a broader politics, of a power struggle. And if mother's difficulties are political in origin, then surely part of the solution must be political as well. My big idea for you all today uh, is that mothers and fathers don't need balance in their work and family lives. What they need is justice. We need to build a policy infrastructure to support what I call work family justice, a system in which both women and men have the opportunity and power to participate fully in paid work and family care. Yes, working parents can and do adopt individualized solutions or, or more likely temporary workarounds, and companies can certainly do far more to help. But there is an aspect of these struggles that only public policy can solve long term. For people eager to push for change and for organizations seriously serious about supporting work family justice, the question is which national policies are important to lobby for. And the evidence points to laws that address four basic needs. The first is paid leave to manage family health and well being. The second is affordable quality childcare during work hours. The third is fair work schedules that accommodate routine family time and expert uh, that, that Danny will hopefully share a bit more about, I'm hoping, <laughs> later in the call. And uh, fourth and finally, living wages to meet basic material needs. And of course, some of these policies are, are a bit more palatable to the lawmakers and employers than others, but there is no denying that they are good for employees along a host of indicators that also facilitate their ability to get their jobs done well. And the result, according to data from other countries, is a virtuous circle in which Workers are happier, more engaged, and more productive. Organizations benefit from improved performance, which offsets costs. And our society, of course, becomes more fair, just, and humane. The harms of the pandemic have been mitigated in countries that already have these work family policies in place. We are seeing the fallout from our patchwork system of support now, and the results are disastrous. In the short term, I think we need a far more robust safety net to support families during the pandemic. Uh, we know that families need another direct cash payment. Like Luke said, I think we need to extend CARES Act programs uh, far beyond December, and we need to prioritize the safe reopening of schools and daycares before all else. We know that without this infrastructure of care, nothing else in our economy works. Uh, the, the sociologist Eric Olin Wright once wrote that the, the, the degree to which people are deeply dissatisfied with the existing conditions of life depends in support on whether they believe viable alternatives are possible. The rest of the OECD shows us that a better set of policies exist. So in my mind, our next steps need to be advocating for these four very common sense policies as parents, as partners, as workers, as employers, and as citizens. It's time to push politicians for real and lasting change. During their working age lives, 86% of US adults become parents. Just imagine the sheer political power of that group if they thought of themselves as a constituency with shared goals. It will take major changes in our country's laws to bring about work family justice, but the pandemic has shown us that it's time to act. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Katie. Um, we're going to turn now to our, our, our fourth speaker, uh, Bradley Hardy. Uh, Bradley, uh, please share with us your big ideas. I'm Bradley Hardy. I'm an associate professor and labor economist at American University. I do a lot of work on economic insecurity, uh, intergenerational mobility, and thinking about the role of the social safety net. And then hopefully uh, the, the idea I'm going to present here um, is going to dovetail nicely with uh, some of the ideas we've already heard. And so this is joint work uh, with uh, Sandy Darity, Derek Hamilton, and Jonathan Mordock. And so this is really thinking about um, just how we generally discuss and consider inequality in America and making the argument that we have to think about multiple dimensions and multiple measures. This is something that the audience here is perhaps uh, more comfortable with, but to kind of get policymakers um, and, and many economists to think deeply about multiple measures uh, of economic uh, insecurity. And, and so, you know, the bottom line is that, as we've already kind of discussed, there are these large, persistent uh, racial income and wealth gaps, right? And in fact, the, the gaps in wealth persist even after you account for, for income uh, or educational attainment. 
But I think what's really important here and what my collaborators and I have talked about is that this doesn't really fully capture uh, the, the daily and weekly experiences of many of our families uh, that are quite economically insecure. Um, and these are the sorts of families that we all think about. Um, and that in fact, much of their experience is one of precarity or, or higher income volatility. And so this unpredictability of the earnings and income stream has all sorts of serious consequences, both for uh, planning, stress, health consequences. It's both um, uh, an outcome uh, and, and a cause of other outcomes, if you will. And, and so the idea here is that many families experience shocks, they experience unanticipated events, but some of them have access to a private safety net, uh, a familial safety net, uh, intergenerational transfers uh, to buffer against those, those shocks, those adverse events. And so, you know, our view is that social policy needs to continue to grapple with the idea that, you know, sort of thinking about the wealth gap and income gap on its own is part of the issue, but that really it's this precariousness um, that has all sorts of root causes and the sorts of issues that other uh, speakers have already spoken to, uh, including labor market discrimination, fewer formalized credentials, uh, moving in and out of the labor market. Uh, we know that there's large differences in employment to population ratios, and much of this then predated COVID. And so these families are essentially uh, ill-positioned uh, to be able to withstand this COVID shock, and in particular, in the absence of uh, sort of consistent policy intervention. And so I just want to take you through what that looks like. Um, in general, and you know, we go into the panel study of income dynamics, and I'm just going to kind of show you what you already know, um, that you know, you could think of the ratio of black to white family income as being anywhere in our measures as being, you know, roughly 50% or so of that of white families. And now if you cut this for different family size adjustments, uh, if you do, uh, you know, counting of home equity, you can get different shares, but the basic gap um, is what it is, right? Um, these gaps remain, you'll get different sizes and different data sets. Now, I can go on and overlay that with, in the blue trend, the black-white wealth ratio. And again, this has been well reported. And again, you're sort of saying, well, you know, black families lag their, their, their white family counterparts in general. I can get some of this to go away if I stratify on income, but the gaps remain, right? So again, you know, you're seeing this, this pronounced gap. And then the one area where black families seem to be above white families is in this notion and description of so-called income volatility. And, and so in this red trend, we're just kind of showing this notion that these family incomes are far more unpredictable. Um, technically, there's a whole range of measures that have been employed in this literature over the years. You're essentially talking about the second moment uh, of earnings or income, a variance uh, measure. And, and this finding is robust across you know, multiple data sets and across multiple measures. Uh, here we're using the, the two-year uh, variance of the ARC percent change in family income, uh, but this result holds, right? So this is kind of what we're talking about. And again, you know, conceptually here, the idea is that you could think of families on this continuum and kind of in my, you know, right panel here uh, of security. And, you know, my co-author, Jonathan Mordock uh, and co-authors have thought about this frame and we've incorporated it nicely uh, in our joint work, this, this sort of continuum of security to being struggling. And, and the idea then is that protection is represented by uh, not just the income stream uh, that could be interrupted uh, by a historic recession, uh, an economic crisis, uh, but that wealth buff buffer. And then, you know, likewise, um, you know, the stability of an income stream that might be more predictable, say like government work, well, then that brings into stark relief the need to think about assistance to state and local governments, where, for example, many Black families uh, are disproportionately represented in employment, right? And so, you know, our, our main point here is that 
there's this whole range of risk factors uh, that Black families disproportionately faced uh, pre-COVID. And we know that in, in a lot of the research that's coming out, um, I'm thinking about some work, for example, by Jim Ziliak and Robert Moffitt, you know, the employment shock, just moving out of work, um, that shock looked to be the largest for Black men and Black women. Um, and for Black men, for example, uh, the employment to population ratio was already um, the lowest, right? And so these are the kinds of things that the, the actual unemployment rate uh, can mask at times. And so I just think that, you know, for the scholars and for the advocacy community, thinking about families that were ill positioned at the outset and considering the whole range of consequences, you could think about this um, sort of including uh, the, the ability to, to kind of reposition for K through 12 educational attainment, right? Um, repositioning your household uh, to buffer the lack of in-class uh, you know, activities with tutors. So you're seeing all these stories where the inequality is loading, right? And so first of all, you know, there's been great work showing that that income volatility means that many families are having to solve for any range of immediate term issues that come up. Our measures are annual. We're actually doing this conservatively. If you were to look at this on a daily or weekly or monthly basis, uh, we believe that the volatility is, is far higher. I, I know Danny and co-authors have thought about this in the context of scheduling um, instability and the lack of predictability that many workers with for fewer formal credentials that they face because they don't necessarily control how many hours they receive. And so, you know, just to kind of close it out, I think that the social policy recommendations you've already heard line up nicely to address some of this problem. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll stop and um, thank you for having me. Bradley, uh, thanks very much to, to, to all four of you. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap us up here with, the, with some short talks. Um, so let me uh, put up my slides and then um, when I conclude, we'll move to a question discussion. And so I encourage you to use the raise hand feature at that point or to pop questions in the chat and um, we should have some good time for discussion. You know, I, I decided to go last year because I figured that by going last, I could kind of count on everybody else to say what I was going to say a little more eloquently. Um, and I was not disappointed by that. So if there are any parents out there doing homeschool, I'll do a little bit of a of a, of a share, share that experience sign for you, because um, I'm really happy that there's so much overlap on this panel. Um, when we when the Biden and Harris administrations turns to the work of building back and building back better for essential workers, for those in the service sector, in food service and grocery and retail and fast food and delivery and fulfillment, building back with higher wages will probably be near the top of the agenda. Um, and that makes sense. When my colleagues, Kristen Harknett and I um, surveyed about 20,000 retail and food service and service sector workers last spring, we asked them what makes for a good job. And what we heard unsurprisingly is that about 60% of workers said that the level of pay was very important to defining a good job, but only 20% of workers reported that they were very satisfied with the amount of pay they were getting. The level of pay absolutely matters for economic justice for essential workers in the middle of COVID and its aftermath. But I would put to you that pay is far from the only thing that matters about job quality, and maybe it's not even the most important thing. When we asked workers what else mattered about job quality, I think we get some powerful insight into what workers in who we think of now as essential really want. They want higher pay, but they also see employee benefits, things like paid family and medical leave and paid sick leave as very important to their jobs and also as something that they're not getting. But I think most striking, and here, I'm really going to do the, the, the me too to, to Bradley, um, uh, is that they want stability. When we ask workers what's very important for a good job, even higher shares say stable and predictable pay and predictable hours, as Katie alluded to. And they're not getting these things either. So when it comes to building back better, we need to build back higher wages for essential workers. But right at the top of the agenda needs also to be to build back more stable schedules and to build back broader access, for example, to paid sick leave. 
So let me back that up a little bit. Um, over the past several years, my colleague Kristen Harknett and our fantastic team of grad students and, and researchers have been collecting data from over 100,000 uh, hourly workers in the retail and food service sectors employed at about 150 of the largest companies in the United States in these areas. And we've collected information from them about their work schedules. And far from a nine to five or eight to four shift or e even a regular night shift, workers have schedules that are unstable and unpredictable that vary from day to day and week to week, often with little notice. Just uh, uh, one third of workers get more than two weeks notice of what their work schedule will be. In fact, a third of workers get less than one week's notice. So 17% get less than 72 hours notice of their schedules. But even when a schedule is published, um, that, that's not the final version. But the only people with edit privileges are employers. What we see is that about one in 10 workers report at least one canceled shift right before they were scheduled to work it in the last month. And a quarter of workers report working on call at least once in the last month. In fact, two thirds of workers report some kind of last minute change to their schedule, being asked to stay late or come in early. This kind of routine schedule instability gets under the skin and it is, has pernicious effects on workers and their families. We find that workers with more exposure to schedule instability are less happy. They report sleeping less well at night. They experience more psychological distress. And as Bradley suggested, it leads almost mechanically to income volatility, not on the annual time scale only, but also on the paycheck to paycheck time scale. Now, some companies have a different approach. A high road in this area is, is very possible in the service sector. So here we see that at IKEA, only 15% of workers get less than two weeks notice. That's against two thirds of workers overall and as much as 80% of workers in the food service sector. But we shouldn't have to count on companies to take the high road. There ought to be a law. And in the last few years, while the federal government has been deadlocked on any kind of action for workers, there, we have seen a really a vibrant and progressive sort of new federalism of labor legislation playing out in cities and states around the country. And one of these areas is around secure scheduling. Um, in cities like San Francisco and Seattle, New York and Philly and Chicago, laws have been passed to require employers to provide at least two weeks notice. And in evaluation work with Kristen Harknett, we find that these laws are beginning to be effective. That following the passage of these laws in Seattle, workers were more likely to get two weeks notice and they were less likely to work on call, to have a shift timing change, to have a clopening shift. Schedules aren't the only thing that matters for workers. Paid sick leave also matters, and it matters perhaps more than ever right now, but it matters just for the seasonal flu and colds and preventive care as well. When the FFCRA was passed, it exempted workers at large firms, and that meant it exempted, as we show here in some of our data, millions of workers employed at the largest firms in the food service and retail and delivery and fulfillment sectors. And that's a problem. That's a problem for these workers um, because those who, uh, have paid sick leave are less likely to work when sick. And it's a problem for the public health in general. Paid sick leave seems to reduce the spread of the seasonal flu and a new work just out. Um, a, a, a group of scholars show that broadening paid sick leave seems to have reduced disease transmission of COVID-19. It also improves jobs for workers and can lead to higher satisfaction and reductions in turnover. Now, one way to get paid sick leave may be to shame the companies that aren't offering it. And we saw a, a really nice example of this earlier in the spring when the activist and, and uh, journalist Jed Lugum um, published a piece uh, uh, that called out the Darden Restaurant Group, owner of Olive Garden, for not providing paid sick leave for their workers. Um, in this case, we find that um, Twitter trolling worked really well. We surveyed Olive Garden workers in the years before and those at other food companies and then we surveyed them in the months after Legum published his piece. What happened? Olive Garden workers told us they got paid sick leave. It went from about 15% of Olive Garden workers who had it to 70% really quickly. Massive change is possible. Um, but it shouldn't take Twitter trolling to get workers paid sick leave. And that's not a policy we can count on working. We need a law. And while the federal government hasn't passed effective paid sick leave for, that covers all workers in the United States, cities and states around the country have taken the lead here. 
And when we worked to evaluate one such law in Washington state, we saw that it effectively broadened access to paid sick leave. Essential workers said they had paid sick leave after this law went into effect, and it reduced the share of those workers who reported working while sick in the prior year. When we build back better, wages definitely need to be at the top of the agenda. But that can't be the only thing that we try to fix about precarious jobs in America. We also need to build back more stable schedules, and we need to build back broader paid sick leave as well. Okay, so I will stop there. Um, and I want to thank all our panelists. I want to ask us all to unmute, if you wouldn't mind, but you have to promise to mute again afterwards and give everyone a, a round of applause, please. Well, thanks everyone. So I, I see uh, 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 one here in the chat from John Molenkoff. Um, John, do you want to ask your question, or should I, uh, or should I ask it for you? All right. So John asks, uh, nativity documentation and citizenship have not come up in the talks. Unauthorized workers did not receive help from the CARES Act, and the public charge rule impedes authorized immigrants from taking up benefits. So this adds a dimension to the problems outlined. What say you? I think this is a, a one for all of us to take on. Um, uh, Elizabeth, Katie, Bradley, Luke, anybody want to begin by tackling this? Um, I, I agree with you. Um, and um, one thing I'll add as a data point is um, I'm, I'm working on um, COVID mortality in Minnesota um, with death certificates. And one of the things that we've found is that uh, it's not only that COVID mortality is occurring really disproportionately in Minnesota for the native population and the black population, which in Minnesota is also um, uh, uh, disproportionately an immigrant population from East Africa. Um, but we're finding also that the rate of excess mortality that is not coded as COVID mortality is much, much higher in those groups. Um, so for indigenous communities in particular, there's a really staggering level of inequality that has just not, a, a, a really staggering level of death that has not made it into any of the state's official statistics um, that account for what's happening in the pandemic. And we don't know yet, are these COVID deaths that are not counted as such, are they deaths by other pathways? Um, uh, but this is a really important aspect of what's happening. So thank you for raising it. Thinking about the CARES Act, I think one of the really great things about the CARES Act was um, how much it expanded eligibility in many ways, but the uh, EIP uh, could be accessed by people even if you didn't have earnings in the previous year, if you hadn't filed taxes. And the uh, expansion of unemployment insurance to folks who would have been left out of that program was huge, was immense, and um, there's been a massive benefit. I think that makes the leaving out of undocumented immigrants uh, even more glaring, right? And really brings into relief the fact that we have in essence set up a system where um, families really are, they're brought, you know, they come to work, they, uh, you know, our policies are sort of set up to allow that to happen. Um, many times people pay uh, taxes, right? And into programs, but then when it comes time for help, uh, that's when um, we just haven't had any movement. So I think that's clearly one of the big ideas is to figure out how do we, how do we create an equitable system that um, if people are here, um, especially when they're working, if they're um, uh, sort of paying into systems, they should be able to access those systems when they need help. You know, I mean, I'll just echo um, you know, all of you and, and add to this that you know, this is poor, fiscal policy, because these families are going to take the received uh, transfers and spend on necessary goods within their, their local economies. And so, you know, this is something that, that just, it's just harmful across the board. I mean, there's the, the, the moral element, but then I just think it's also just poor fiscal policy in terms of standing up, you know, the other businesses within these local communities uh, where the money can flow. One other question in the chat here, and that's a, a question um, for Bradley. Um, Bradley, this question is asking, you know, what are the, if you think about the, the, the problem of volatility, um, what are the causes sort of the, what's the, the role for treating the causes of volatility, whether that's schedules or other, or unemployment, you know, unemployment or what, versus the sort of helping to buffer the effects of volatility through policy? 
No, no, so it's, it's a great question. I mean, we found over the years in our work examining sort of the drivers of, of volatility is that, you know, in general, you know, employment exits, you know, short employment spells, you know, if, if your income goes from something to zero, then in percent terms, that's going to have the, the, the largest effect on our, on our measures across different demographic groups. I would say as an aside that we find that, you know, workers with fewer formal credentials tend to have higher earnings and income volatility as well. Um, but, you know, interestingly, you do see higher volatility also among the very, very top earners uh, in, in society. But that's typically, you know, basically the subcomponent of income from, you know, stocks and, and things like that, right? So, it, you know, the nature of that portfolio, you know, it's the worst possible portfolio in terms of having income that's not only low, but unpredictable. Um, you know, in terms of solutions, I think that there's sort of relatively low cost interventions. For example, thinking about the recertification process at the state level. Well, you know, you know, recertification within social safety net programs to be complete. Well, you know, you can imagine that there's an argument for drawing out that recertification period if you think that family incomes are going to bounce up and down, right? Um, versus taking a, a short snapshot where it looks like the family's doing better, but in fact, it's very transient in terms of transitory, in terms of that, that, that well-being status. So, you know, certainly I, I just also think that we have a whole body of evidence that income matters, right? And so uh, liquidity matters. There's been lots of um, activities within TANF that go outside of core activities. Um, so I'm not saying that the only thing in TANF that matters is cash. Uh, but cash is important, uh, you know, work training is important, but there's a lot of stuff that goes way beyond that domain. So I also think there's some low-hanging fruit uh, to, to try to address income volatility. I could say more, but I'll, but I'll stop there. Danny, Great, could I just thanks. add um, yeah, in on that one too, uh, just to, I think sort of understanding the extent to which our our social safety net actually exacerbates the kind of um, instability that Bradley's work shows is important. So one, of course, we have refundable tax credits that bunch up at one time a year. And there's some positive elements to that too, but it means that money's not there uh, when somebody is in crisis. And also if their earnings fall to zero, their accrued EITC falls to zero as well. And then even a program like SNAP and uh, TANF to the extent it still exists, uh, you have lots of families across the year who drop off at recertification periods, right? So you have a lot of instability. Um, and also families struggle when their earnings go up and the marginal tax rate means their SNAP benefits go down. In fact, the Children's Health Watch had a great health affairs paper a few years ago that suggested actually when families' earnings go up, they lose their, some of their food assistance and they actually are more likely to experience food insecurity. So I think uh, everyone will think I, you know, I have a one trick pony, which is the child allowance, but these are some of the principles that sort of underlay that, right? To say a stable monthly source of income and you can layer on top sort of the annual windfall so people can think about capital improvements on top of that, but let's make sure there's sort of a base uh, for families with kids that they don't fall below and treat them like they treat, uh, at least at the University of Michigan, I'm on nine month uh, salary, but they won't let me take my salary over nine months because they don't trust me uh, with my money during the summer, right? So making sure that there's some stability over the course of the year uh, isn't gonna get rid of all of this volatility, but it's gonna even it out a bit. Um, let's take one from the chat. Um, uh, uh, Robert asks, uh, I would be most interested to hear how hopeful, confident each panelist is that their important policy proposals can or will be implemented within the next four years. Um, so um, yeah, let's hear it, Let, and let's go. Let's go through. Um, uh, 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 we'll we'll start with the easy stuff. Elizabeth, do you want to tell us? I think what I want to say is that uh, it's really hard, actually, to know uh, what could be possible in a scale of four years because it actually depends on what we do. So I'm in Minneapolis. Um, I think the idea that there would be mass support and mainstream discussion of defunding the police um, just five months ago would have been shocking to many of us, but here we are. Um, and I think a lesson that 
we should learn from that is that uh, if we start by limiting the scope of what we want to what seems pragmatic in the moment is actually not a pragmatic approach because it misses the way that uh, it actually can change very quickly what seems realistic when there is a mass change in the way that we recognize the problems. And so uh, what I'm hoping that we can do with some of these disparities in mortality is start to have this sense of um, uh, recognition of the problems. Um, I was really struck by that Eric Olin Wright quote um, that, uh, that Katie used, um, you know, that what we'll tolerate depends on what we think the alternatives are. So that's where I'd like to see us really push. Katie? Thank you, Robert, for your lovely question. Um, my, my opinion of what's possible in the next four years has shifted this week in a positive direction. Uh, you know, policies like, you know, the Family Act that, that would put a national paid family leave insurance program together, I think is very possible. Eight states in the District of Columbia now have these policies, um, these laws in place already. They have neutral or positive effects um, on, on local businesses, and the economy. And I think what we're seeing is a domino effect with a lot of these policies in the same way that Danny pointed out, right? You have places like Seattle and Washington implementing a variety of, of, of protections and supports for workers um, that, again, aren't having deleterious effects effects locally. And my hope is that we will see many of these supports play out in, similarly, right? It's working locally. Why not expand it nationally? And I, I, I do think that the pandemic has opened up some sort of fissures in our collective imagination about what we might expect from the government. I think rarely um, did people spend a lot of time thinking about the government or the state as a very real actor in their daily lives. And I think in the pandemic, it's one chance that folks have actually been able to look at other countries and say, wait a second, it's not playing out similarly elsewhere. Perhaps it could be playing out differently here if only we had um, different you know, supports at a national level, different leadership. And um, so I, I am hopeful that these work family policies in particular, um, especially the Family Act, I think is, is my what I'm most optimistic for, um, that HBR piece that's coming out will outline what I think are kind of, Eric Olin writes what he would call accessible way stations toward this real utopia of work family justice, right? What are the policies on the table already that can move us in, in that direction? And so uh, I'm feeling hopeful, but maybe that's just because I've been feeling so bad in the past months that any hope feels really, uh, I'm clinging to it at the moment. <laughs> Uh, great. Bradley, Luke, you've each talked a little bit about this already, but if you want to revisit, um, say anything more about the prospects here. Yeah, it's, um, it's fun to be on a panel with a lot of hope because uh, I also have a lot of hope. Um, you know, when you have a sort of a policy, I think we're now to a point where we're talking about the level of benefit, but um, some of the principles in play of full refundability, um, that's been, uh, it's a priority of the House Speaker, Nancy Pelosi. It's a uh, it's been listed as a policy agenda item for the incoming presidential administration. Uh, it has a lot of support in the Senate uh, and it has bipartisan support. I think um, we're now looking at questions about uh, how big and uh, what do we actually get, right? And what the amount is gonna be. And an important question on that to me is sort of, does it roll out monthly or does it roll out uh, annually? And I happen to think that the monthly is pretty important that we want sort of a stable source of cash income for families and, and that families will really like that and they'll feel supported. And it's something that uh, once it happens um, that uh, people will, it'll be, it will become very popular. Um, so I, I'm quite hopeful. And, uh, but just as um, with Elizabeth said at the beginning, like when I started talking about it, I, I thought it, it was, it was off the charts sort of um, still an idea. And I think there was a lot of support, but it was not something that really could become law and now it is. So I think that that speaks at least to me about, about stretching the boundaries and seeing, and seeing what's possible. You know, I, I just kind of you know, finish off by saying that I think in, in our case, you know, the, the idea of the problem I was presenting, I think is now sort of gaining some resonance and sort of resonance and recognition in many rooms um, in terms of just broader economic insecurity and thinking about a combination of, you know, scholars, um, you know, policymakers, think tank types, these issues, um, the issues we've talked about today are now being seriously discussed in rooms where, where I believe this has the ability to be translated into some policy response. I'll just rattle off quickly. I was, I was scribbling down thinking, you know, you have discussions about everything from 
you know, paid leave policy to child allowances, um, really robust monthly uh, tax credits run through, you know, social security system, for example, but also UBI proposals, federal job guarantee, uh, reparation studies that are being conducted by serious uh, think tanks that you wouldn't typically associate with these sorts of studies. So I think that there is a discussion occurring now where it, it certainly moved uh, minimum wages, right? So I think, yes, there's reasons for optimism. It'll be interesting to see where we land. And I'd just add, uh, you know, on the scheduling front, um, hey, if it was President Warren, I'd feel really good. She is a longtime sponsor of the Federal Schedules at Work Act. Um, which would take on these issues. But I, I feel, you know, there, there is a legislative template here um, that's been uh, introduced and discussed in the past. And we have, uh, we've learned a lot from local laws. And I, I think this is a, a path where we might see real action in addition to work on paid sick leave, like the Paid Act um, that, that, that others have highlighted. Um, all right, well, let's, um, let me turn to a question from Sandy Jenks, um, who asks, um, I think of uh, Elizabeth, but anyone who wants to jump in afterwards, has anyone looked at health among black men in the military? Do they get more or less equal health care to whites? What are the outcomes? Another possibility might be to look at black white differentials in health among college professors or among people with the best university health plans. Um, so Elizabeth, why don't you start on that one if you don't mind and, and others can uh, form any other thoughts that they'd like to add. Well, I definitely have not seen anyone looking at college professors, although I'd be very interested to read that. Um, what I know about the, um, the literature on the health insurance piece is pretty mixed because on the one hand, we have a bunch of studies that try to find an effect of insurance on health generally, um, using health insurance shocks um, as an instrument to, you know, when there were sudden expansions in access, um, and they generally find very small or no effects um, in improving health. And on the other hand, we have uh, a, a other studies that look specifically at disparities and argue that lack of insurance is actually a big driver of disparities. Um, and there's a, a, a way in which there's sort of like a common sense of um, you know, if you uh, have uh, not had insurance yourself or been close to someone who hasn't, you know, you see the kinds of trade-offs um, that people make in practice um, that, it, you know, it sort of feels like, well, how could that not be deleterious to health? Like a lot of us kind of have seen up close what that looks like. Um, so I would say that uh, uh, this is an area where the, the research to me seems really hard to put together. Um, and I think it's plausible that insurance access is an important piece um, of disparities, um, but certainly not the whole story or even necessarily the key piece. So this isn't- you want to jump in on that? Yeah, I'll just say quickly in Michigan, uh, so I work um, with the Department of Health and Human Services that released data on the um, on race, on COVID cases and deaths uh, very early on as one of the first states to do so. And so we saw these disproportionate impacts of people of color, especially in the city of Detroit. Um, and so that uh, uh, the state responded by creating a task force to figure out what were the policy levers that we could pull uh, that would be um, able to address that. And those were pretty quickly adopted, including um, very large scale expansion of testing uh, in the city and otherwise. And uh, I think sort of the trend line has been remarkable in Michigan where um, in the first few months, um, African-American Michiganders were vastly overrepresented in COVID case and COVID deaths. Um, but since then, actually they are underrepresented. So they've gone from over to uh, well underrepresented. And um, I'm not sure if this gets at Sandy's question, but uh, the fact that policy could identify and, um, and be responsive and actually f flip that uh, with a very explicit look at it, um, I think was striking to me. Let me uh, pose another one from the chat. This one's for Katie. Um, Work-life conflict is often sort of comes in the same breath as conversation about corporate practices and policies. You make a case for governmental action is there a role for firms here? Uh, what is it? And you're muted, sorry. Of course, right? <laughs> uh, I do think that there's a role for firms here. I was really excited that Harvard Business Review asked me to write a piece about 
what national policies firms should be pushing for. I thought that was an interesting request in the first place. Uh, so yeah, there's absolutely a role for firms here. And I think it is in some of sort of pushing the needle and making these, these measures seem more palatable. Um, it also opens up opportunities for researchers to do studies at some of these firms to show the effects of these policies. Um, the, the difficulty, of course, the drawback here is that when these work family policies are implemented at the firm level, what we see is disparities widening in the workforce amongst workers who work for elite firms, typically highly educated salaried employees who have access to these benefits, and then uh, much more marginalized, you know, low income or hourly workers um, suffering some, from some of the many difficulties that Danny outlined for us all who don't have access to these policies and who most need them. So, you know, Netflix was um, hailed as being really progressive in offering a, a, a year of paid family leave, right? And it was only until a backlash in the media when it was highlighted that that policy was available only for their salaried employees and not their hourly workers. Um, and kind of an a la the Olive Garden case, <laughs> it, it required a lot of pressure for them to open up that policy more broadly to support hourly workers as well as, as salaried workers. So I do think there's a role for the firm. I think it they can help. Again, they're, the, the business lobby is very strong in this country, right? They have the ability to try to campaign for these policies at the federal level that would in fact have them funded differently than having to fund them privately. Um, and so I think that they can be a powerful force for, for lobbying, but I also think they can be a force for social change and showing that these policies are good for business. They are good for the bottom line. Um, and showing that I think is one way we're going to actually move the needle at the federal level. Yeah, and I, I think that is a nice way to reframe the company response, which is as a powerful interest group, as a very powerful interest group, rather than as saying these should be voluntary actions that we ask firms to take on. It seems like COVID may have also sort of focused firms just on what that business cost is, um, or, or one would hope. Um, okay, uh, well, we might as well get to it because it was going to come up. Kristen Harknett, who has conveniently left the room after asking her question, asked us to contend with the question of the UBI. Uh, universal basic income. Um, how does that uh, uh, fit in here? Um, who would like to, to tackle this one uh, first? Okay, I'm going to tackle it first and then Luke's going to go. Okay, well, here's what I'm going to say about this uh, uh, is that, you know, I think one thing not to lose sight of is that even with the UBI, and, and in some sense, a lot of our attention when we think about the UBI is thinking about the labor force effects, but we would expect then with the UBI, many workers will continue to work. And I think what we need to recognize is the UBI provide, may provide many things like a, a, you know, a floor on income, but it may not solve the problems that working itself as apart from its income generating function has. And part of that problem is that if work remains really dysfunctionally organized in terms of unstable schedules and, um, and, and, and similar experiences at work, then UBI doesn't necessarily solve those. I think the other thing is that work itself is a so fundamental source of meaning and purpose and dignity when done right. Um, and so even if we hope that the UBI might displace jobs, um, that is potentially a real loss. Now, it's not a loss if your job is terrible and abusive and a source of discrimination. That, that's not a loss. But it, a, a more hopeful a utopian vision is that work can fulfill that, that purpose of dignity and respect. And therefore, we wouldn't want to you know, sort of turn away from that. I'm actually a big believer in the dignity of work and, and trying to improve the quality of jobs. Um, both from you know, my quantitative research as well as my qualitative research and asking people that I've gotten to know for years what, what they want, what they're looking for, a stable job. It's sort of right along the lines of, of Danny's slides. Um, of course, I also have to grapple with the fact that I think cash is the best way to help families a lot of the time, right? So uh, you, know, you see a lot of evaluations where the income support just vastly outperforms um, a lot of the other things that we know how to do. I do, you know, uh, I would kick it back to Danny. Sometimes I do worry that uh, when we sort of impose requirements on firms, that firms are smarter than us and, um, and that they will figure out ways to get around um, different laws that we might pass and do what they were going to do anyways. Um, so your slides with sort of the impact of reducing people calling, you know, working while sick are um, really helps me with that. Um, but with UBI, actually, I'm a little, um, I, I am also a believer that you have to have like a really, 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 really good motivation to vastly change uh, the way that society works. And uh, UBI, you know, just the back of the envelope um, dollar figures are so huge that it would just cause like a massive restructuring in society, right? Of, um, uh, it, we're talking about doubling the size of the federal budget. 
And so I guess that's where I come down on chat allowances. And, um, you know, I hate to offend every single person on this call, but I care more about kids uh, than adults. Uh, I don't see any kids on the call, but I believe parents probably know how to help their kids, but I would rather do something for kids. And I think a child allowance is actually sort of a step in and we can see how it goes. And then, uh, but I'm not ready to think about sort of the fundamental transformation and all of the questions entailed with that, be it the work question, be it the question of like people on notches on our safety net who are actually will do worse uh, if uh, depending on sort of what gets taken away to make a UBI possible. The taking away part is where I'm interested in. What do you lose? Um, when you implement, because some folks are very supportive of a UBI, but they envision it as a substitute for the transfer system as we currently understand it. Yeah, Elizabeth, please jump in. I'll just add to the dignity of work piece, which I also really um, agree with and think is key, but that we could also imagine um, allowing the freedom to find dignity in other things that will never be part of the workplace economy or the market economy, right? Including child rearing. Um, and thinking about giving people a lot more space to find their own life projects that aren't necessarily monetizable for somebody else's benefit. Okay, we have time for one more question here. And this is a, a really in the weeds question for Luke, but I think he's up for it. And, and that's, you know, can you, can you weigh in here on the, um, sorry, let me see here. Um, you sort of talked about, you know, you sort of made this distinction that I'm trying to summarize that, um, that the child tax credit being fully refundable is sort of shorthand for child allowance. But can you talk about the distinction between a tax credit based approach and a, and a child allowance that might stand outside of the tax system? Social security, yeah. for example. Great. Uh, yeah, so um, in, in all events in the United, in, in, in every scenario, I think we're talking about tax policy here, right? So uh, if people are more comfortable with child tax credit, uh, you can go there, right? And, this is, I mean, it's essentially tax policy. We're either talking about giving money, right, or taking money. Uh, but also there's a pretty important reason why it's tax policy, which is that um, making it tax, uh, a tax policy question means uh, it only requires uh, 51 votes in the Senate, right? So um, you can imagine we have a child tax credit right now that uh, like the EITC, you sort of earn as your earnings grow. And, and so families who have zero earnings, they get zero. And, and, and then actually they get nothing for the first 3,000. And then at 3,000 and upward, they start accruing that child tax credit. So the key piece here is full refundability, right? And full refundability means all of those families get the full credit at the very bottom of the scale. And in our scenario, we would say everybody gets $250 a month. We're gonna treat everyone the same up through, you know, uh, very high income uh, families where we're gonna phase it out shortly. Uh, and then we probably are gonna like tax it back at whatever your marginal tax rate is. Uh, but it starts at sort of the idea that everybody gets the same and it basically increases the families that are in that bottom range and don't get the full credit right now. So that's all those people who get zero, right? But it's also all those families that as it's going up, uh, they don't get the full credit until they get to a certain level of earnings. And that's where it has sort of a disproportionate effect on reducing racial inequalities because there are more families who are black that fall in that sort of gap, right? Half of families uh, with kid, kids fall within the, the space that they don't get the full credit. So the, the current credit is actually quite um, inequitable. And, and so full refundability would mean we're going to bring it down to the full amount to the very uh, lowest. And, and, and then the second question is, do we just do this annually, right? Do we just bunch it up? And um, I, you know, there's great research on the earned income tax credit that I've contributed to that shows the positive impacts of sort of a, a windfall at one time of the year. Um, but, you know, there's a, at least some evidence um, internationally that uh, if you want to help people with capital improvements, give them one payment once a year. If you want to help them reduce their food insecurity, you do it monthly, right? Or maybe you even do it less than that. Um, and so sort of a child allowance, right, as, as I envision it, is sort of a set amount received monthly um, that does sort of count against taxes as you go along. Um, but uh, a fully refundable child tax credit could sort of take the form looking exactly like that or could be sort of bunched up uh, one time a year. And so this is the details, right? This is when we get into the weeds that matters, uh, matters a great deal. Okay, 
I realized I actually went to 120 instead of 115, so that's on me. But I appreciate many of you staying with us. Um, and I want to thank our panelists again and thank all of you for joining us and thank Pam for uh, uh, helping organize this fantastic series. Please join us next week uh, when Sandra Smith will have a, a panel on criminal justice and inequality. Uh, thanks to you all.